Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan Fitzgerald. I'm a partner in the Greenwich office of Cummings and Lockwood. And like Jesse said, I'm going to pick up right where she left off on the new legislation uh, regarding trust in Connecticut. I'm going to highlight two very specific points uh, of the new law, and that's the new rule against perpetuities that will now allow dynasty trusts in Connecticut and the Directed Trust Act. Both of these laws were passed as part of the Uniform Trust Code in an effort to make Connecticut a more attractive jurisdiction for the administration of trusts and so that wealthy individuals don't feel compelled to set up trusts in states such as Alaska, Nevada, South Dakota. Part of the competition that you've probably all seen to drive trust business to a specific states. So going forward, Connecticut's going to allow both dynasty trusts and directed trusts. Uh, and these concepts, don't get me wrong, are not mutually exclusive. Most dynasty trusts can be and are often designed as directed trusts. And a directed trust may or may not be a dynasty trust. These are the two provisions that I would say drive most people to other states. So this is really going to open up new planning opportunity, both for Connecticut residents, but for Connecticut trust companies and banks. So let's start with the new rule against perpetuities. What is the rule against perpetuities? It's a law that we inherited from the English common law that says you can't use deeds or trusts to control the ownership of property long after the lives and being at the time the document's executed. So the current law right now, to simplify it, is about 90 years in Connecticut, right? It's a little more nuanced than that. But after 90 years, property can't be held in trust. It must come out of the trust and be held by individual persons. So starting in the 1990s with Alaska, states started to either get rid of their rule against perpetuities or extend their rule against perpetuities to try to get trust business to their state. So right now, South Dakota and Delaware have perpetual trusts with no expiration. Nevada and Florida have 360 years. Other states allow 1,000 years. And so the people that were drafting the Connecticut legislation, apparently as a reference to the year Charlemagne was named the Holy Roman Emperor, chose 800 years, and there's no other magic to it. It was just that's what they picked. And so to get this new 800-year rule against perpetuities, it won't apply till after transfer or for transfers after January 1st, 2020. So if your clients are interested in this, they're going to have to wait a little bit to take advantage of it. So next year... Clients can set up their trust without having to use a corporate or professional trustee in another jurisdiction to get advantage of a very, very long rule against perpetuities. So who are dynasty trusts appropriate for and what is it? The dynasty trust is really a trust that simply put is designed to last for a really, really long time and hopefully benefit multiple generations. The trusts are appropriate for your clients who want to, have the ability to, and can afford to maybe put the full $11,400,000 gift tax exemption into a trust for their descendants and apply their generation skipping tax exemption and really build somewhat of a family bank and have it avoid a state gift and generation skipping tax for many years to come. Like I said, many clients use this as a family bank where it's available to their children. They can make loans to their children. They can make distributions to their children. And if the children don't need it, it can pass down to the next generation free from any sort of transfer tax. It's common to build in spendthrift provisions so that it can be protected from creditors of a beneficiary, say a divorcing spouse or a tort plaintiff. And it's also it can be used to protect from future grandchildren from themselves or children from themselves if they have sort of uh, any sort of you know addiction problem or something like that. As Rachel mentioned, we are the only state with still has a Connecticut gift tax. So Connecticut clients do have to be careful. Right now, you can't go over the $3.6 million exemption without causing immediate tax. So also, as Rachel mentioned, we're going to look at the client's assets to maybe try to find uh, non-Connecticut assets to maybe get more into the trust without causing immediate taxation. So another big reason clients were creating trusts in jurisdictions such as Delaware and South Dakota was to take advantage of the Directed Trust Act that these states had enacted. The Directed Trust concept was created to capture the desire by those who set up trust to separate the traditional roles of a trustee so that various individuals or institutions can handle all the different tasks that a trustee traditionally handled. And 
most clients have trust in their estate plan in one of two ways. They're either giving to trust during their life to minimize the estate taxes, or after they're gone, they establish trust under their estate plan that care for their loved ones, such as a spouse or children. And the directed trust concept can apply really in either of these scenarios. So going back to basics, traditionally a trust is a legal relationship where a trustee owns legal title to the property and has the fiduciary responsibility to manage the property for the benefit of the beneficiaries. When designing these trusts with clients, we often talk to them about who is the right person to serve as trustee. Yet during these conversations, we have to explain that traditionally the trustee held many different roles and they were really responsible for all these different tasks. And so traditionally the trustee was responsible for the investment of the trust assets, so they had to be investment savvy. Traditionally, the trustee was responsible for the distribution decisions, so they had to you know, know your family members or know your beneficiaries to make that decision when those people actually get assets into their own name. On top of that, the trustee was also responsible for filing income tax returns, making court disclosures or beneficiary disclosures, as Jesse mentioned. And so with the old law, the trustee was really responsible for everything, and under the old law, even in Connecticut, you could delegate, but the trustee still had the duty to monitor the delegated person, right? So if it's a delegation to a co-trustee or an agent, you still had the duty to monitor and you were potentially on the hook liability-wise for the bad acts or negligence under a delegation. So oftentimes clients felt compelled to name multiple trustees to try to get all of these different jobs done. Now, under the Directed Trust Act, the traditional roles of a trustee can be you know, bifurcated or trifurcated or cut up however you, the client would like. And you can name people that are not even trustees to have certain roles. So under this new law, the legal title is going to be transferred to a, a trustee now known as a directed trustee. And that directed trustee is only going to have the traditional powers of a trustee that are not given to new players that we're going to call trust directors. And the trust directors are going to have the very limited responsibilities that they're given under the governing document. It's important to note that these trust directors are still considered fiduciaries and held to a strict fiduciary standard. They're going to have to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries. They're going to be held to a high standard for skill, diligence, care, and self-dealing, all this typical stuff you see with a fiduciary. They're going to be under the same disclosure rules as a trustee and have the same you know, potential liability, but everything will be judged now in the limited context of their role uh, under the document. So I tried to figure out a way to visually depict a directed trust for you all. And I have a three-year-old. And so one night when I was begging him to eat his chicken nuggets, I wish someone would beg me to eat chicken nuggets. I thought that his construction dinner plate was a great metaphor for a directed trust, right? Instead of being a typical dinner plate with no dividers, here my son's dinner plate has, you know, each type of food stays in its little area. The plate itself represents the directed trustee because it still holds all the food, but now each item's managed in a different area. The little nifty construction utensils have very specific jobs and, you know, working with the plate, hopefully they get the mission of the trust uh, accomplished. So the real innovation of the directed trust is that the directed trustee or the trust directors have no duty to cross monitor, right? The trust directors don't have to monitor the other trust directors or the directed trustee. And it goes so far in the statute to say that if a trust director doesn't like what the directed trustee is doing, they don't even have a duty to notify the beneficiaries that they would have done something different. Under the statute, the only way you're going to be held liable is somehow your act amounts to willful misconduct, which is not a defined term, so case law will eventually you know, define what that means. The statute is drafted in such a way you can create a trust director under the document for anything you can think of that will fit your client's particular scenario. I've thrown a few examples up on the slide. But, you know, if you have a client that's an entrepreneur and in his or her estate plan, they want to leave the business to a trust for their descendants, but they have a, an employee that really knows the business well, they can name that person to be the trust director just to make all the decisions with respect to the business while naming maybe someone else as either the directed trustee or someone else to uh, make the distribution decision. So it will allow you to really divide up the jobs if that's what the client wants. As I said, the, the possibility is really limitless. The two common iterations I think we're going to see most are the investment director role and the distribution director role. 
I say this because we've been drafting these into Delaware and Nevada Trust for a long time, and they're very popular with clients. The investment director is going to be someone that decides when assets are bought and sold. So if there's a portfolio of marketable securities, the investment director will call up the directed trustee and say, Exxon or whatever should be sold today and we should buy shares of this. That will be their job. And the directed trustee's job is just to act on the investment director's directions. Distribution director is going to be the other common iteration that we're going to see. And this is going to be someone that will make the distribution decisions. And this really solves the problem for a client who wants to name a bank or an institution but doesn't want that bank making the decision that maybe needs a little more family knowledge or high touch so they get to make the decision when the assets actually go out to the beneficiaries. For those of you who have clients who are creating trust to reduce their taxable states during their lives, you know, we must be careful, as Jesse said, to always make sure we don't have any powers included in the trust that will cause estate tax inclusion. And so Keeping the distribution director position is a no-brainer. You can't do it. If you're creating an irrevocable trust, you cannot keep the distribution director. The IRS will stay. You, you still own the property. It will be included in your taxable estate. However, under current law, the, the retained power to invest the assets, as long as, as long as it's a fiduciary obligation, will not cause estate tax inclusion. So you have a client that is you know, a hedge fund manager, and they think they're you know, no one can invest better than them, they can now give an interest in a trust to either their hedge fund or a speculative asset, and they can keep the power to decide how those assets are invested. And so for those of you that are trust professionals, you've probably had to turn down roles of trustee because the client was undiversified or really wanted to put something that you were not comfortable having the trust own. So now you can potentially have that person serve as investment director while you still get the trust business and get to do the piece that you like to do. So with that, I want to distinguish the effective date of the Directed Trust Act because it's a little different than the rule against perpetuities and it's a little different from some of the other pieces. So you can put these things into trust now or some of your clients might have already had these kind of concepts put into documents before and the law says it, it applies to any of the decisions made after January 1st, 2020, even if the trust was created before January 1st, 2020. So we still don't have a decanting statute in Connecticut, but hopefully we're working on that and we can get that passed next. The law does say you can decant trust back to Connecticut to take advantage of these laws, so that is a positive. And so with the 800-year rule against perpetuities and the Directed Trust Act, Connecticut is certainly becoming a more attractive jurisdiction to administer trusts. And so with that, I'll say thank you.